Hello, I'm Jody Rosenblatt from the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. And in this segment on epithelial cell homeostasis, we'll be talking about how epithelial cells die through a process my lab has discovered called epithelial cell extrusion. Now, just as a reminder, epithelia work together to form these epithelial cells, you can see here, work together to form a protective barrier for not just your body, but all the organs in your body. And although they look static, they're turning over at very fast rates through epithelial cell death and division, as you see here. Now, to do this, they really need to um, match the numbers of cells that are dying to those that are dividing. And moreover, we need to understand how epithelial cells can die without disrupting that whole barrier function. And the first thing we wanted to understand is whether they could, if we triggered cells to die, could they um, maintain a constant barrier, which is their function. And so to do this, we, we took um, cells in culture and plated them on filters so we could measure their electrical resistance, you could see here, over time as a measure of the barrier function. And when we triggered cells to die with a pulse of shortwave UV, you can see that they're able to maintain the same uh, constant barrier as control monolays where there's no cell death. And even at this last time point here, around 50% of the cells are actually dead, but they're still able to maintain a functional barrier. This just shows that disrupting the barrier by disrupting the junctions can you can see deflections at this electrical resistance. So this is really working. It's just able to do this. So how can it maintain this barrier? And the way it does so is through a process that we discovered called epithelial cell extrusion. Now what you'll notice in this cell, these are just these MDCK cells we've treated with UV to induce cell death. And when they die, they pop up out of the layer. And as they do so, the cells surrounding them move into the space where that dying cell once was so that no gaps ever form in this layer. To do so, these cells signal to their live neighbors surrounding them to activate formation and contraction of an actin and myosin contractile ring, which will squeeze around and below to heft them out into the lumen, the luminal space. And so by doing this, they're able to maintain this, this constant barrier. So when we first found this, we wanted to understand the signaling that can control this process. And there were two very broad models that could control this. One was that there, these cells could sense a change in tension um, and that they would react by forming this actin-myosin cable. And the other idea was that there could be an actual positive signal coming from the cell that was going to extrude to activate this formation of actin and myosin to contract the, the cell out. And we haven't really ruled out this, um, this model yet. And th there could be still some valid points to this model. But what I'll show you in this next series of slides is that there is a positive signal that activates this cable. And the way we identified that was through a, an assay that we call the cell addition assay. So what we would do then is, is produce a population of cells that were apoptotic or cells that were live, just that were just grown without UV irradiation here. And then we would trypsinize them and label them with the FITC lectin to label them fluorescently in green. And then we would add them onto the monolayer and test whether the apoptotic cells could trigger this actin-myosin assembly as we saw in the ring. And when you do that, what you see is this whole assay here. Um, but I'll break it down into parts so you can understand what we're looking at. So by looking at just the DNA channel, you can see whether the cell that was added was live, which is large and intact over here, whether it was in early apoptotic stages, which was similar to those cells that were being extruded, or whether it was in late post-extruded stages. And when you now look at the actin channel in the, the live monolayer area, what you can see is that only early apoptotic cells would cause this actin assembly. Cells that were live did not do this, which was good to know that they weren't activating a form of cell-cell um, contact. And furthermore, late apoptotic cells did not do this, which was interesting because it also suggested that this wasn't a phagocytic cup, which may happen to engulf the apoptotic cells that were added. So this suggested then that there was something on the outer surface of this, ap this early apoptotic cell that was triggering this actin-myosin cable to form to squeeze the cells out. And 
we wanted to then identify what this was, and so we needed a better starting material. And based on the fact that not just early, ap not just apoptotic cells would get squeezed out, but if we would overject a cell when we were um, microinjecting or just stab a cell, those cells would also get extruded. So necrotic cells, not just apoptotic cells, will get extruded. When we start with necrotic cells in this assay, they're completely dead. They cannot recover from any treatment that we give them. So this way we could treat them with, with um, trypsin, which would proteolize all the, the proteins, and we could see if it was a protein or not. So when we did this, we treated them with these enzymes, and we would, they would still label them and use the same assay. And what we found was that trypsin treatment had no impact on this um, ability for this, this, these bits of cells to trigger this signal. Whereas when we treated with phospholipases, this did destroy that activity. So this suggested that potentially the signal was a lipid and not a protein. So when we started then looking, we started fractionating these lipid fractions, but we also started testing uh, candidates. And what we found was that the signal was really a signal, was a lipid called sphingosine phosphate. And the way we tested that is if we could block the production of sphingosine phosphate with the sphingosine kinase, so sphingosine kinase would, would cause sphingosine to become phosphorylated and turn into sphingosine phosphate. And when we did that, we blocked this reaction here. You can see that, that this rate goes way down. So this really suggested that this, this activity was sphingosine phosphate. To test that in situ in our extrusion assay, we also treated the, the extruding cells with the sphingosine kinase inhibitor. And when we did, what you can see is that these cells that are dying didn't, were no longer able to extrude. Instead, they form holes at sites where cells are dying compared to control um, treatments where these cells can extrude out of the layer and they, that, that gap closes. So now we know that this signal is a, is a lipid called sphingosine phosphate. There were known to be five different receptors that sphingosine phosphate can bind to. And these are all G protein coupled receptors. Um, and, and so we went then testing these different candidates to see which uh, receptor this might be binding to activate the extrusion. We, when we did so, what we found is that extrusion requires the sphingosine phosphate 2 receptor. If you use antagonists to all the other receptors, 1, 3, 4, and 5, this does not block the extrusion similar to the control. However, antagonist to sphingosine phosphate or knockdown of sphingosine phosphate by shRNA block this extrusion. Furthermore, we could find by staining for sphingosine phosphate, we could see that these, um, the sphingosine phosphate forms puncta very early on in the cell that's going to extrude. You can see this in green here, that there, these cells are, are forming puncta that form around this, um, the interface between the extruding and the live cells. And interestingly, that these puncta get then taken up in the surrounding cells as the cells are extruding. So this is a much later stage. You can see that the puncta are in the surrounding cells. We know that this, this uh, antibody can identify sphingosine phosphate because it's gone now if we, we inhibit um, sphingosine phosphate production with the sphingosine kinase inhibitor. And if we use the antagonist, the sphingosine phosphate 2 antagonist, the sphingosine phosphate stays in the cell and sort of builds up here. So it really needs the sphingosine phosphate 2 receptor to um, take up the sphingosine phosphate in the surrounding cells. So taken together, we have this model for how sphingosine phosphate can control um, apoptotic cell extrusion. When cells undergo apoptosis, they simultaneously produce a lipid sphingosine phosphate that then is emitted to the surrounding cells and binds to a G-protein coupled receptor sphingosine phosphate 2. And this goes on to activate Rho, and we are also thinking RAC now, to produce this actin and myosin ring that will contract to squeeze it around and below, and squeeze it out of the, the monolayer. So this is how cells are extruded when they're triggered to die. But we next wanted to understand how cells naturally undergo cell death in an epithelium. How, how could this also match the number of cells that are dividing so that we can maintain constant cell numbers and the epithelium function normally? And so to, to look at this problem, what we did was went 
looking at lots of different types of epithelia. And this just shows the human colon tissue epithelium. But every type of epithelium we looked at, we saw the same sorts of results. So if you stain for uh, apoptotic cells using an active caspase 3 marker in green, what you see is that places where the cells are dying, they're also extruding. This was not too surprising, because this is what we found in all cases in, in epithelia, is when cells die, they extrude. But in the cases. Most of the time, now remember, these epithelia haven't been treated with any apoptotic stimulus. So what we found most of the time is that cells are extruding while they're still alive. You can see that these are caspase negative cells, but they're still extruding out of the, the epithelium. And so this seems that these cells are not really undergoing su cell suicide, but they're getting pushed out by their neighbors. So once these cells um, leave by extrusion, they really have nothing to live on, and they go on to die through a process called anoecus, or death due to loss of survival signaling. Now, the survival signaling is really important for epithelial cells, and that comes from the matrix below where, where the cells are attached and this, the neighboring cells. And so when they, they lose contact with this, then they'll go on to die just due to loss of survival signaling alone. So this really suggested to us that epithelial cells die really as a result of extrusion first. This made us then wonder what could cause cells to extrude. And we got hints from this by looking at the sites where we saw cells extruding. And what we found is that they were always extruding in conserved zones. And these zones were always 1.6 fold more crowded than the places where they were not extruding. And there were zones that were curved, and, and this may have an impact on the ability for a cell to extrude. But even in flat monolayers, we found that the places where they were more, most likely to extrude were always 1.6 fold more crowded. So this was our observation, but we needed a way to test whether this was actually true, whether crowding could cause cells to extrude. And so to do that, we created a stretching device that we used in reverse. So this is a stretching plate here. And when you grow the cells in a stretched state and grow them to a confluence and release them, then they will become crowded, as you see here. And this is what we, we actually see in these, um, these epithelial cells at 30 minutes. You can see that they become quite crowded. But what you'll notice is that by six hours, they go back to these homeostatic densities that they prefer. So it's as if these cells have a sense of personal space. You know, these are too crowded for them. And this is where they feel more comfortable. And this reminded me, actually, of humans, because we all feel a sense of personal space, and we can tell when people have come within about an inch of our personal space, we feel uncomfortable, and we do what we need to do to, to get back to a density we prefer. And so to demonstrate this, I thought I would use a person. And that person is Blake, my, my daughter's friend, also known as Scrappy Bradford. Um, so here she is at a density that she prefers with her friends. My, my daughter's Nadia and Polly. But what happens if? if Blake comes into a much higher density of people? What if she goes to a party that after this Halloween outfit is put on? Or what if she goes on to a, a concert? So this is a free concert in the park. Now, Blake is really in a space where she gets too crowded. And so what happens is she gets extruded from the monolayer. And that's exactly what happens to our epithelial cells. So what you can see is that after about two hours of crowding, these cells extrude. And like we saw before during homeostasis, most of these cells are alive while they extrude. Now, what you'll notice is that by six hours, they go back to homeostatic rates of extrusion, as seen in the control, um, at the point where they really are going back to homeostatic densities. So it really seems that these cells, when they become too crowded, they use extrusion to get back to the, the numbers that they prefer. So from this assay, we were also able to identify that the same sphingosine 1-phosphate, sphingosine 1-phosphate 2 row pathway that controls apoptotic cell extrusion also controls live cell extrusion. This assay also allowed us to investigate whether these cells, when they extrude, are actually alive or we just are not able to identify apoptotic markers. And so we took cells that had extruded off into the medium and replated them to see whether they could grow or not. And what we found is that they were able to grow into a completely new monolayer that could 
divide and extrude on its own. Similarly, when we took cells from homeostatically grown um, monolayers, they could do the same thing. By contrast, when we triggered cells to extrude and die, they, would go, they could not do this, and they just would die and sit in the plate. So the take-home lesson here is that cells are extruding while they're alive, but normally, because they have nothing to live on, they'll go on to die. But they're completely alive, and if they had new substrate, they could go on to live. So this made us wonder whether there could be an, a parallel pathway that can control live cell extrusion. In the past, we'd identified that death signaling could activate apoptosis and cell extrusion simultaneously. And if you blocked um, the death pathway at the same time as you, you triggered it, you would block both of these from happening. However, in the case where these cells are live, it didn't make so much sense that we're going to be going through a death pathway. And so we, we looked for candidate signals that could control live cell extrusion. And so we went looking in stretch and stress pathways. And what we identified was the same stretch-activated channel we had identified for um, stretch-induced mitosis, and that is the stretch-activated channel piezo-1. And as a reminder, this is a, this is a channel that sits in the membranes and measures deflections in the membranes to activate calcium influx. And when we block piezo, we find that now, after crowding, these cells are no longer able to extrude. And if you count them, you'll see that they remain crowded. They're not, they, they stay stuck like this. So there are really two separate pathways for, for extrusion, an apoptotic cell pathway and a live cell pathway. And it's very important to know that, that both exist, that, that when you trigger cells to die, they'll undergo extrusion simultaneously with cell death. This is important to know, especially if you get pathogens or undergo chemotherapy that these cells are, are being extruded so that no gaps ever form when cells are triggered to die. But we think, for the most part, most of the time your cells are really experiencing cell death through this crowding-induced pathway, which goes through piezo-1 and activates calcium to, try, to, to trigger cells to um, extrude, and then they die from this extrusion. So, so far, we'd only shown, we've only shown you what goes on in cell culture. And every time we're finding these new um, properties about how epithelial cells behave, we wanted to test if they're really true in vivo. And so what we did is we went back to our zebrafish epidermis model to test whether piezo was required for maintaining these constant cell numbers by extrusion. And so when we blocked piezo by knocking it down through morpholinos, we found that the cells would, ex would no longer extrude and they would um, form these big masses at sites where they should have extruded. You can see this better in this movie here. So normally, in the wild type situation, they're able to maintain constant numbers here. You can see by this DNA staining. And they do that by these cells will divide more closely into where the, uh, the notochord is and then migrate away and extrude. The same thing happens in the piezomorphant, but these cells, instead of extruding, just pile up at sites where they should have extruded. So this really suggests, then, that in all these different epithelia we've looked at, that piezo-mediated cell extrusion is important for maintaining constant cell numbers. And it leaves us with this model for how epithelial cells turn over. So epithelial cells divide at, at defined sites here in the crypts and, and other sites that are more stretched out. They migrate away from these sites of division. And as they do so, they congress in these areas here. And once they become 1.6-fold more crowded, they'll activate cells to extrude through, the, through sensation through the piezo-1 channel. These cells will extrude alive, for the most part, but then go on to die because they've got nothing to live on. So you, you can see now how these mechanical tensions can really control constant cell numbers in the epithelium. When cells are, are dividing, every time another cell divides, this will cause crowding up here, which will cause cells to extrude. So you can imagine if you enhance the division rate, if you double the division rate, this would cause more tensions, which would cause these cells to extrude more rapidly. If you block the ability to sense the crowding, as you saw with the piezomorphin, that cells amass at sites where they should have extruded. <clears throat> 
So together what we found is that there's really mechanical tensions that are controlling both cell division and cell death. And that if cells become too sparse, they will experience stretch on their membranes, and this will activate through piezo-1 and also through YAP and TAS and beta-catenin to activate more cells to divide so that they get back to the constant numbers. And if they become too crowded, they'll activate cells to extrude to also return to these constant numbers. Now, one thing that's surprising for us when we found these two things was that piezo is controlling both of these processes. So opposing processes are controlled by exactly one signal. And the other interesting aspect of this was that the ratio of crowding was also similar to the ratio of stretch. So 1.6 fold more crowding, you get cells extruding, or 1.6 fold more stretch, you get cells dividing. So this was an interesting ratio. And we wondered how this might um, occur, whether because piezo is really just controlling calcium influx, how could it control these two opposing right, reactions? And what we found is that they're actually specific for the type of, of tension that they're experiencing. So if the cells experience crowding, they'll only elicit extrusion. They won't ex elicit cell division. And conversely, if they experience stretch, then they'll elicit cell division, but not cell death. So how can these two different tensions be sensed? We're not really sure yet, but we're investigating this, this process right now, and we'll keep you posted. And some of the, the hints may come from where piezo localizes at different, different densities. So in cells that are subconfluent, they really exist at this nuclear envelope, whereas as they become, uh, they come into contact with each other, piezo now starts going to the plasma membrane. And these are places that are more stretched out where they would be more likely to experience um, stretch and induce mitosis. This may happen more readily at that plasma membrane where it can, can, can sense the stretch on a membrane. Now, as the cells become more crowded and into areas where they're more likely to extrude, we see piezo developing into these large cytoplasmic masses. We, we can't really look like, we're not quite sure what these masses are, but we're thinking that they may be the ones that can be experiencing crowding to relay calcium to cause these cells to extrude. So how this happens, we're not very sure yet, but please stay posted. We think it should be an exciting result. So in the next segment, what I'll be telling you about is now that we've learned that these different tensions can control constant cell numbers, you might expect that if you disrupt these processes, and we'll be just looking at extrusion, you could get different defects and different diseases that could result from not enough cells, if there was too much cell extrusion or too much cell death or poor cell death. And also, we'll, we'll see that disrupting the whole extrusion process can actually lead not only to tumor formation, but also tumor progression. Um, and I'd like to end by thanking the people in my lab who've done this work and also my funding bodies. Thank you. <laughs>